Thank you, Joe. Um, it's my, my privilege to, to introduce Professor Mayon Guy, who is the Lund Family Professor of Asian American Studies and Professor of History at Columbia University, where she received her PhD in 1998. Uh, a very distinguished historian who works on issues to do with immigration and citizenship. Uh, her books include the multi-award winning work, uh, Impossible Subjects, Legal Aliens and the Making of Modern America, which came out in 2004, and then in 2010, The Lucky Ones, One Family and the Extraordinary Invention of Chinese America. Uh, uh, my st students use her work and uh, find it incredibly interesting and stimulating. Uh, her keynote lecture today, which relates to her current book project, is on the subject of the Chinese question, the, go the gold rushes and global politics. So I'm delighted to introduce Professor Mayo Gao. I guess I can just put my paper here. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, um, thanks to the School of History and to Professor uh, Mark uh, White and Professor uh, Dr. Cohen. Um, and I also wanted to uh, acknowledge uh, Ms. Mashumi Bonick in the History Office for making all the arrangements for my trip. Um, thanks all of you for having me here today. Um, I did my PhD with Professor Foner many years ago. Um, and uh, so I was trained as an American historian, um, and I wrote my uh, dissertation, uh, which became my, my book, on the origins of undocumented immigration uh, into the United States in the, in the uh, 20th century. And uh, Chinese exclusion was not the principal uh, subject of my book, although exclusion predate, you know, it predated European restriction. Um, uh, but it lay much of the legal groundwork for restriction. So now I've gone back um, to the Chinese exclusion era um, in the 19th century, um, but I'm doing it from a global perspective. That is, I'm looking at it in the United States as well as um, other parts of the world. Um, and I take seriously the, challenge, uh, the challenges of doing transnational history. And I must say, in the United States, I think the Americanists um, who are uh, very quick to adopt fads, academic mm -hmm. fads, are actually uh, not the best at transnational history. And I think that is because as Americans we live in the United States and we imbibe a lot of the nationalism um, of our country um, and our historiography I think uh, is poorer for that. Um, so, uh, but doing transnational work I have found very challenging. It means working in multiple archives, it means learning multiple histories, uh, multiple historiographies. Sometimes I feel like I'm studying for my oral exams uh, over again. Um, so, so this, is, uh, this talk is, uh, comes from uh, the book that I'm writing now on the Chinese question. All right, so. Can you all see this behind me? Okay, good. All right, so uh, around the turn of the last century, some half dozen countries enacted laws that prohibited Chinese immigration. These countries constituted an arc that ranged from the Americas across the Pacific to Australasia, and then across the Indian a Ocean to South Africa. The late political scientist Aristide Zolberg called it the Great Wall Against China. Now the conventional explanation for Chinese exclusion is that Euro-American workers in the receiving countries feared competition uh, from cheap Chinese labor, and indeed this perception was widespread. But there was something special, I contend, something more about the Chinese question than emerged in the late 19th century. It carried the unmistakable whiff of racism, and it appeared to be a global problem. But how Chinese immigration became a global race problem has not, in my view, been adequately explained. At one level, we might note the obvious that global ideas emerge in a global environment. And to be sure, the period between 1875 and the First World War was one of unprecedented global integration, achieved through the increased circulation of people, capital, goods, and ideas. But we might pause and ask, why do some ideas become global and not others? How do ideas acquire global force? Of course, there were general stereotypes about China that circulated in the West since the early 19th century. Orientalist constructions about the so-called stagnation and despotism of the East that served to define the so-called progress and vigor of the West. But in the late 19th century, these ideas were too general, too vague, 
to have political force on the ground. In important ways, the local was the generative side of politics, to paraphrase Tip O'Neill. But politics also travel, as it were, and borrow from and copy the ideas and policies of others. There's a dynamic interplay between local and global politics, and it is this relationship that interests me. I should also note that what appears here as a global Chinese question was more precisely a phenomenon of the Anglo-American world. This directs our attention then to a more specific question about the role of Chinese exclusion in the trajectory of British and American power in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. In this account, I emphasize similarities and connections between the American West and the British settler colonies, which may all be understood as white settler frontier societies. James Bellish wrote instructively about these similarities in his important work, Replenishing the Earth, but curiously, Bellish had little to say about Chinese and Asiatic exclusion. Furthermore, while Bellish wrote mainly about similarities, I also want to pay attention to connections, that is, how the politics of Chinese exclusion traveled and developed across these regions and merged into a global racial discourse. I begin with the gold rushes because they were the key developments in global political economy that set the conditions for the first mass contact between Chinese and Euro-Americans. In the span of 50 years, more gold was extracted from the earth than in the previous 3,000. We might think of the 19th century gold rushes as a stimulus, a new stage of capital accumulation, which made possible the expansion of world trade and in particular, the rise of Great Britain and the United States as the world's leading investor and creditor nations. The discovery of gold also launched into motion hundreds of thousands of people from the British Isles, continental Europe, the Americas, Australasia, and China. In California and in the Australian colony of Victoria, Chinese comprised upwards of 30% of the mining population in the 1850s and 60s. The gold fields were fluid international contact zones on the frontiers of the world's core societies. Many miners were serial rushers, but others settled down and became idealized by their descendants for their democratic and entrepreneurial spirit. They marked the advent of settler colonialism, which congealed the frontier, to paraphrase Jürgen Ostenhammel. Without exception, these polities excluded the Chinese. Now, most studies on Chinese exclusion movements tend to view anti-Chinese racism as a homogenous global idea as though it just floats up there and people just draw it down when they need it. In my research, I've been struck by the differences in the Chinese question on the ground, especially during the gold rush period. The global Chinese question did not emerge fully formed like Athena from Zeus's head. It shifted and evolved as it moved across and shaped the Pacific world. So what follows then is a kind of travelogue of the Chinese question uh, as an idea or a set of ideas which over the course of several decades acquired the status and force of a global idea and the role of that idea in the rise of Anglo-American hegemony. So we will start in California where the discovery of gold on the North Fork of the American River in January 1848 drew prospectors from the Eastern and Southern United States, from Hawaii, Mexico and Chile, Great Britain and Europe, Australia and China. In the early fevered days of the rush, white Americans found nativism a convenient weapon of competition. It's all for us, not for you, a crude expression of American manifest destiny. By 1850, they had already successfully driven from the gold fields Mexicans, South Americans, and many Europeans, <coughs> accepting only those from the British Isles and Germany whom they regarded as their ethnic kin. Anti-foreign sentiment then zeroed in on the Chinese who were just arriving in large numbers in the early 50s. The Chinese were also arriving when placer or surface miner mining was beginning to give out, so anti-foreign feeling now mixed with the bitterness of dashed hopes. By 1852, Chinese, uh, the arguments against Chinese took on a special cast with white Americans accusing them of being indentured workers or coolies imagined as slaves or semi-slaves. In fact, Chinese miners worked in a variety of ways, least of which was under contract. They worked mostly as independent prospectors, as this miner here with his rocker, and in small cooperative groups, uh, as well as for wages for white-owned companies, practices that were common among miners across ethnic lines. <coughs> 
Chinese workers hired on wages built many of the flumes for water companies and in hydraulic mining. The North Bloomfield Mining Company in Nevada County hired 800 Chinese and 300 whites in its ditches. But if Chinese were not actually indentured, the larger fiction that they were a coolie race overwhelmed any inconvenience of fact. Anti-coolism imagined Chinese as innately servile without individual personality or will, regardless of their actual condition. It was a racial shorthand that drew on two comparisons. First, it recalled the so-called coolie trade of indentured Asian labor to the former plantation slave colonies. Second, and much closer to home, it associated Chinese with African slavery in the American South. That second association positioned Chinese immediately as a racial threat to free labor. The coolie trope was actually not invented on the gold fields, but in Sacramento as the first weapon, uh, as a weapon in the first chapter of California state politics. As early as 1850, some California elites were promoting grandiose visions of developing a new empire along the Pacific Slope, one that potentially stretched from Alaska to Chile. Some saw Chinese labor as key to that development, uh, which labor they believed to be cheap, potentially unlimited in supply, and at the time before the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, more readily accessible than labor from east of the Rockies. The proposals to develop the Pacific Coast with Chinese labor varied in concept. For example, the Presbyterian minister, William Speer, a former China missionary who established the first Christian mis mission in San Francisco's Chinese quarter, imagined Chinese labor in California as part of a grand vision of Sino-American unity. Speer promoted a mutual embrace as part uh, between uh, China and the US, one based on friendship, commerce, and cultural exchange. He believed Chinese workers were willing, honorable, and industrious. Moreover, they knew how to cultivate cotton, silk, and tea, which Speer believed could be planted in California. Other Californians drew inspiration from the practice of importing indentured Chinese and Indian labor to the British plantation colonies of the Caribbean after the abolition of slavery. In January of 1852, two California legislators, George Tingley, a Whig, and Archibald Peachy, a Democrat, introduced bills into the State Senate and Assembly, respectively, to enable the recruitment of foreign workers under contract into the state. These so-called coolie bills proposed that the state guarantee as enforceable labor contracts made abroad between American citizens or companies and foreign workers for work in the United States. Now, Tingley and Peachy were not interested in contracting labor for mining. They both envisioned Chinese labor for developing large-scale agriculture, perhaps some variation of southern plantations. The assembly passed the Peachy Bill, but opposition to the Tingley Bill in the Senate gathered force from free soilers who outmaneuvered him and defeated the bill 16 to 2. And without the Senate Bill, the Peachy Bill died on the vine. Now, opponents of the Cooley Bills were not necessarily against all Chinese immigrants. The Daily uh, Alta California opposed the Cooley Bills as bringing a system of servitude into the state. But the paper supported free immigration and thought the principle applied to all comers, regardless of origin. But this distinction between free and indentured Chinese immigrants quickly blurred. Governor John Bigler was largely to blame for this obfuscation. Although the Cooley Bills were dead, the governor could not help but give the issue another kick. In April, he issued a special message to the legislature, which raised alarm over the, quote, present wholesale importation to this country of Asiatic coolies, unquote. He warned there would soon be 100,000 Chinese in the state and declared that nearly all were being hired by so-called Chinese masters to mine at pitiable wages, three or four dollars a month. He called upon the legislature to impose heavy taxes on the Chinese to check immigration and for a law barring Chinese contract labor from the mines. Now the Cooley bills were dead and Chinese in California were not contracted or indentured, so what was Bigler's purpose? Well, he had won his first election in 1851 by a mere thousand votes. In 1853 he would be running for re-election and he needed to excite the mining districts to his side. The 49ers were restive as the plasters were rapidly giving out, and a diligent miner could now only make $5 a day. Many were already working on wages for others earning about the same. By tarring all Chinese miners as coolies, 
Bigler found a quick, quick and easy racial trope that compared Chinese to black slaves, the antithesis of free labor, and therefore a threat to white miners' independence. The newspapers published Bigler's address, and the governor also printed it as a leaflet and distributed it throughout the mines. As he had intended, he aroused the white mining population. His speech gave white miners license to attack Chinese and their property, and it provided an ideological theme that rallied a movement for exclusion. Across the state, miners' assemblies passed anti-Chinese resolutions, bidding them to leave, or more pragmatically, forbidding them from first ownership of claims, which enabled white to sell their worked out claims to Chinese when they left. The idea that Chinese were in unfree became widespread. For example, the mining and scientific press called Chinese, not just miners, but all Chinese, coolie slave labor, a degraded race that was, quote, morally impossible to civilize. But Chinese continued to work as independent prospectors on wages and in small cooperatives and companies. The use of Chinese gang labor, first seen in the construction of mining infrastructures, as I showed you those flumes, um, and later in building the Transcontinental Railroad, further confirmed white Americans' belief that Chinese were held in bondage. In fact, ethnic gang labor can be traced to the contracting of Irish workers to dig canals in northern states from the building of the Erie Canal um, from the late 1810s through the 1840s. In the antebellum north, contemporaries considered Irish navvies to be rough and intemperate, but they did not accuse them of being slaves, which obviously they were not. But after the Civil War, contracted labor assumed an ambiguous place in American political culture, which had drawn a bright line between servitude and slavery on the one hand and free labor on the other. But as free labor came increasingly to mean waged work and not independent farming or artisanship, drawing a line against contracted ethnic labor was a way for native white workers to address their own sense of precarity. The association of ethnic and racial others with unfreedom enabled that construction, which otherwise was not so clear cut. In fact, race obfuscated the ambiguities in concepts such as free labor, voluntary migration, and especially the contract. As freedom of contract became the watchword of free labor under laissez-faire capitalism, the contract remained associated with indenture and servility for Chinese. Anti-Kuliism remained foundational in the 1870s and 80s as the urban workingmen's movement and state party politics drove the Chinese question to national exclusion uh, legislation in 1882. Now it's note wording just briefly here that while exclusion sharply limited the number of Chinese who came to the United States, it was not able to drive all Chinese from the country, including from the gold fields. Chinese small companies and cooperatives continued to mine for gold and they built communities that thrived through the end of the 19th century and into the 20th. Some 5,000 Chinese lived in and around Chinese camp, located strategically on the stage road from Stockton to Yosemite. The white section of town hosted saloons, hotels, suppliers, blacksmiths, banks, and the like, while the Chinese section had various other types of businesses, such as tailors, seamstresses, uh, merchandisers, as well as representatives of all the major district or clan associations of Chinese. Today, though, Chinese camp is a ghost town with just the tall sumac trees which Chinese planted, they call them trees of heaven, remaining. Thousands of Chinese also continued to work in the northern mines along the Yuba and Feather rivers, many even returning to their claims shortly after white miners pushed them out at Bigler's urging in 1852. They built a community in the city of Marysville, the gateway to the northern Sierras, which persisted even as it and the whole city declined in the late 19th century. Today, this temple, the Bakai Temple, is the oldest continually operating Chinese temple in the United States. Now, in Australia, conditions were similar to those in the American West. An international rush following the discovery of placer deposits in 1854, followed by a shift to capitalize quartz mining. As in California, Chinese miners engaged in independent prospecting, small companies, and egalitarian cooperatives. And they also worked on wages for European-owned companies. 
They also organized themselves into the same hometown associations and brotherhood societies that were common across the Chinese diaspora. Racism towards Chinese on the Australian gold fields was more inchoate than in California. There was racial tension and conflict, to be sure, and a few anti-Chinese riots, some of which seemed to have been instigated by Americans. They all seemed to have taken place on July 4th. But white miners aimed their ire chiefly at the colonial government, which required an expensive miner's license and policed the gold fields to enforce compliance. Although many Europeans disdained the Chinese, they did not allege that the Chinese were indentured or enslaved. The legacy of unfreedom in the Australian colonies was not racialized African slavery, but convict transportation of the English and Irish poor. More important in their perceptions of Chinese were fears generated by their location at the fringes of the British Empire. The Melbourne Argus explained, quote, geographically, we are nearer the pent up millions of China than any other large tract of country occupied by the white man, unquote. Australians obsessed over their fragile hold on the continent and their vulnerability in a larger contest in Asia between two empires, the British and the Chinese. In Victoria, anti-Chinese agitation clashed with official colonial policy of equal protection. This principle, enshrined in precepts of Enlightenment liberalism, was a conceit belied by Britain's vast empire acquired through violence and dispossession. In general, Victoria conceded to and protected European interests. But the colonial government did oppose individual and group violence against Chinese. Police were more likely to arrest and prosecute Europeans who committed crimes against Chinese in Victoria than they were in California. And the colonial government compensated Chinese for losses suffered during uh, riots. It is also worth noting that, unlike California, some Chinese miners married European women and started families. Chinese and European miners continued to work claims side by side in the gullies. The coolie trope did not enter Australian politics until the late 1870s and 80s, and it came not from the gold fields, but from the so-called top end, where controversy had grown over the use of Asian and Pacific Islander contract labor in Queensland and the Northern Territory. White Australians had conceded the use of co colored labor on the plantations in the tropical far north. But the problem in Australia was that the tropical areas were not separate islands like Jamaica or Mauritius, but contiguous to the temperate zones which Europeans had staked out for themselves. By the late 1870s and 80s, whites in Australia were becoming increasingly alarmed at the growth and mobility of the Chinese population in the North. The Chinese question emerged as a core element of an emergent Australian nationalism, which viewed racial homogeneity and free labor as conditions for democracy. This was a new ideological formation, forcefully masculinist and racist. Anti-Chinese leagues sprung up in big cities like Melbourne and Sydney, even though the urban Chinese population was tiny and economic competition was negligible. In 1878, the Siemens Union struck the Australian Steam Navigation Company to protest its use of Chinese sailors on its vessels, a reminder of the racial stakes in the Pacific world. References to the, in the Australian press to Chinese exclusion uh, were frequent and explicit. Newspapers reported regularly the speeches of Dennis Carney, San Francisco's notorious Sandlot orator, and many made direct comparisons between the ruinous effects of Chinese immigration on California and Australia. By the 1880s and 90s, most of the Australian colonies had enacted some restrictions on Chinese immigration, but still, British imperial policy prohibited categorical exclusion. It was only with federation and self-governance in 1901 that white Australia came fully into its own. The new parliament quickly passed legislation. The first law passed was Chinese exclusion, and the next two were laws to deport Pacific Islanders and to exclude Aboriginal peoples from the franchise. Just a few years after Australian Federation in 1904, Chinese began to go to the British colony of the Transvaal in South Africa to work in the gold mines on the Witzwatersrand, which was and still is the, larger produce, the largest producer of gold in the world. Between 1904 and 1910, the Transvaal Chamber of Mines imported over 60,000 Chinese for work on the Rand. <coughs> 
This novel experiment was aimed at reviving the gold industry and addressing the shortage of native African labor after the South African War. It was also a ticking political time bomb in the post-war context, as South Africa's racial policies were still in flux. That is, it remained unresolved what would be the basis for reconciliation between whites, British, and Afrikaners, and what would be the policy towards native Africans. Now, unlike Chinese in Australia and California, Chinese miners went to the RAND under contracts that set their wages and hours forbade them from working in any other occupation or industry and from owning or leasing property and required them to return to China at the conclusion of their contracts. But if Chinese mining laborers were indentured, they were not docile. They were well organized. They had yi hui, or righteous societies, on each mine. And within six months, the program faced a crisis of labor discipline and social control. Between 1904 and 1907, nearly 25,000 Chinese laborers, about a third of the total number of Chinese sent to work on the RAND, were convicted of various offenses, including refusing to work, rioting, staging work actions, desertion, as well as uh, assault, manslaughter, and murder. 45 were sentenced to jail terms of 10 years or more, executed or shot dead during disturbances. Now, these figures do not include the most passive form of resistance, passive refusal to drill more than the minimum number of inches required to get paid, despite the use of the lash and other punishments like withholding food. By 1906, the superintendent of the Transvaal Foreign Labor Department despaired that supervising Chinese laborers was a hopeless endeavor, in his words, indexing a general trend of declining e efficacy of, in the use of Chinese indentured workers in the European colonies. Soon the problem became quite larger than the specific demands of the mine labor program. There were sensational accounts in the Transvaal about Chinese mine deserters roaming the countryside and attacking Afrikaner farmsteads, and in Great Britain about floggings and other conditions alleged to be akin to slavery. The crisis assumed an incendiary symbolic force of the Chinese question, building upon half a century of European experience with Chinese immigration to New World settlements. Not coincidentally, the white English-speaking skilled miners and artisans in the Transvaal included many Australian and Cornish workers who had traversed the mining circuits of the Anglo-American world. The Australians who dominated the leadership of the South African trade unions were direct carriers of anti-Asiatic labor politics, and the Cornish who traveled in a circuit between England and uh, South Africa brought those politics back to England. The Chinese question on the RAND emerged as a key issue in two major political elections in 1906 and 1907, the general elections in Britain and the elections for responsible government or home rule in the Transvaal. Both elections brought new parties into power that spe and spelled the speedy demise of the Chinese labor program and set broader political trajectories into motion. In Transvaal, the Afrikaner Het Volk Party, led by the former Boer commandos Jan Smuts and Louis Bota, rode the Chinese question to power, setting the course that would lead the colonies to federate at the, as the Union of South Africa in 1910 under the banner of radical white supremacy and racial segregation. South Africa joined Canada, Australia, and New Zealand as self-governing dominions of the empire, all based on white settler rule, native dispossession, and Asiatic exclusion. In Britain, the Chinese question helped the Labour Party overturn 20 years of nearly unbroken conservative rule in 1906 and galvanized the British trade unions to form an independent Labour Party. A new angle of white labor interest came to the fore in the framing of the Chinese question in metropolitan politics. Both liberals and labor used the moral capital of anti-slavery in its rhetoric, rhetoric but neither supported free immigration to the colonies, betraying the racism of their position. British labor, like their cousins in the Dominions, and they were quite often literally cousins, believed the settler colonies were for British emigration and not for anyone else. Here we can discern the emergence of an imperial white working class politics in which white workers across the Anglo-American world called upon their governments to protect them from both capital and the colored races. In the colonies, white labor gave popular support to elite political interests, which in a sense were rather parochial insofar as they sought power over their own particular node of the empire. 
the Chinese question gave them common cause and a global stage. For Great Britain, white settler autonomy was the price of developing Australia and South Africa inside the empire and not, as Chamberlain fa famously said, like the United States, outside of it. The dominions got to have their cake and eat it too. They would be self-governing, but they would still receive the empire's protection from the proximate threats of the yellow peril and black Africa. So one may detect now a certain completion in the circumnavigation of the Chinese question. Its contour is forged in crucibles of nation building on the frontiers of empire. From diverse local conditions, there emerged a common global discourse. And we should not forget the role of the United States in the coming of the global Chinese question. Not only was the coolie trope born in the American West, for white settler colonials in Australia and South Africa, the post-Civil War United States, that is the United States of the 14th Amendment, was broadly speaking an object lesson in the folly of racial equality, witnessed the consequences of unchecked Chinese immigration and black reconstruction. But so then did white America come to its senses and offer solutions in racial management, Chinese exclusion, and Jim Crow segregation that inspired like policies in white Australia and segregated South Africa. If the first bricks of the Great Wall against China were laid by the United States, that wall grew and promoted the development of the American West, Australia, and South Africa as so-called white men's countries. So in conclusion, what general lessons can we glean from this travelogue? First, I suggest it highlights a distinction between prejudice or racism and politics about the role of power in the production of difference. While tensions and conflict existed when Chinese and Euro-Americans first came together during the gold rushes, that alone did not produce Chinese exclusion. The Chinese question as a theory of racial danger and exclusion as a state policy emerged as constitutive elements of nationalist politics, politics that were at once nationally specific and part of an emergent global discourse. Second, I hope that a more expansive transnational perspective can help us appreciate the importance of Chinese exclusion as part of a dynamic interplay between Anglo-American e expansion and the containment of China. Imperialism's footprint in China was set down with opium, gunboat diplomacy, unequal treaties, and war indemnities, to be sure, but also from the exclusion laws. The wall protected and advantaged American and British territorial and economic expansion, which depended on control over land, resources, markets, labor, and not least gold, the foundation of credit. Of course, it could not last forever. After World War II, decolonization loosened the regimes of exclusion, and the end of the Cold War hastened a new era of global economic integration. A different world informs the Chinese question today. Today, anxieties about China's economic power as a new yellow peril are generated by contemporary issues of global economy and politics, but they also draw from a deeper history of ideas and forces that powered their circulation and their rise to the status of the global. Thank you. Okay, that's a great question. Um, so let me take the first one about what circulates. So one of the things I found really interesting was the, um, the existence of Chinese um, or social forms of social organization throughout the diaspora. And we, kinda, we know that these exist, but um, very little has been done on um, these, these organizations on the gold fields. They're, we mo mostly know about them in urban contexts. But from the beginning, 
Chinese came and they formed what we would call hometown associations based on their county or even village, right? Mostly their county of origin or their, their dialect group. And these were groups that um, both, I mean, traditionally provided assistance to newcomers, like lodging when they arrived or information about where work was available. They also um, were uh, organizations that, uh, through which people remitted money back to their families in China um, and also were cr credit instruments. And collect they lent money and collected debt. Um, and they were the principal organizations that um, uh, got lawyers to defend Chinese when there were issues, whether there were individual issues or civil rights challenges. Um, the other organizations that, that did this work um, throughout the diaspora, and there's been even less research done on this, were um, secret brotherhood societies, which came out of southern China um, in the 19th century, these were uh, anti; these were kind of fictive kin organizations of unattached, kind of dispossessed m men who formed these secret ritual societies. So they were both protective and mutual aid groups, but they were also predatory. I mean, they often, you know, robbed other people in their areas, and so they had elaborate secret rituals and oaths that kind of cemented their solidarities. Those also spread throughout the gold fields, and they. They also are very famous in, um, in uh, Borneo, West <coughs> Borneo, which is where there are a lot of Chinese miners. So these secret societies, act actually it's one main group, like they have the same um, oaths and rituals. So you can, people have found their handbooks in, in Arizona or in Victoria, you know, they're all over the world. So they also, they were actually um, the groups that uh, formed mining cooperatives where they were egalitarian, um, they had no bosses, they shared everything, they split their chores, they shared their expenses and their profits. Um, they were small, you know, 10, 12 people. Um, so this, these mining cooperatives were mostly associated with the secret brotherhood societies. So I think that they, um, in Australia and the United States, the Chinese all came from the same region of Guangdong province. So there was a lot, and some Chinese went from a, California to Australia, although it's hard to determine how many. Um, so there's definitely information that flows. Now, I'm going to go on a little bit. The really interesting thing is when they start to recruit Chinese to go to South Africa in 1903, 1904, which is already s decades later, they, the British start to recruit in southern China. And they cannot get people to go. It's a complete <coughs> failure. There are press reports from Johannesburg, from Cantonese merchants, who are there, who write back to Chinese newspapers to say, don't come here. This is a living hell. You will be reduced to the status of savages if you come to South Africa. They, um, they had local magistrates and even provincial officials um, outlawed uh, British labor recruiters from cities and from areas in both Guangdong and Guangxi counties. Um, and on the practical side, for people in southern China who already knew about plantation um, labor, um, many people could go to Southeast Asia to work on short-term contracts to Malaysia where they weren't really indentured. They were like six months or a year. They could go back and forth. So why would you want to go all the way here to an unknown place that you heard terrible things about if you could just circulate locally? So the British, so they can't recruit. So they eventually get people from Shandong province, and they can only get people there because the, that m labor market that was active to Manchuria was closed because of the Russo-Japanese War in 1904. So the 50, 000, 50 to 60,000 workers mostly come from here. Now, there are some complaints that you read in the archives written by the British or the colonials that these were um, that all this trouble took place because they were bo they were former boxers among them. I don't have any corroborating evidence that that was the case. But they also had similar kinds of um, uh, mutual aid organizations and societies. On every mine, there was a Chinese. There was a group of Chinese. They also often 
um, were behind the gambling rackets. I mean, they weren't you know, the greatest people, but they were organized. So they organized strikes. They called for the riots. I mean, Chinese battled policemen in the compounds, thousands of them, for hours with stones, bottles, bricks. You know, for example, when um, they wanted people to work overtime and they didn't want to. So they fought it out in the, in the compounds, in the courtyards. So there was a lot of, a lot of fighting, but there is definitely uh, networks of information that, that travels among the Chinese and organizations. Um, so, thank you so much, and we think you guys such a wonderful intersectional, intersectional and between slave and unfree and wage and mm -hmm. race, but I was wondering if there's room for gender, especially one of your ending points is creating a white man's country, and there was such a stark difference in the field of cartoons. For the U.S., it was, um, yeah, the, sort of the Chinese uh, question versus the one that's in Australia, where it's a sort of little, you know, the little boy and the Chinese question, it's, you know, it looks like it's Lady Liberty and, and the Chinese man is hollow below. But there's room in your analysis of what people are working on for this question of gender. Mm -hmm. That's a great, great, thank you. Um, yes, I do have to think more about gender. I mean, definitely the... Um, well, in the United States, there's this kind of, um, the, the Chinese, mi Chinese are, are, are characterized either as coolies, which are kind of feminized characters, right, emasculated figures, uh, because they're servile, and also because they end up in occupations that are as seen as women's work, like washing and cooking, right? Um, and Chinese women are depicted all as being prostitutes. Whereas in Australia, Chinese men are more um, seen as sexual predators, right? It's, so it's not the same uh, in terms of its gender construction. Um, and you don't have the same, I don't think you have the same um, force of prostitution among Chinese in Australia. I mean, it's there. I mean, empirically it's there, but it's not, it's not seized upon the way it is in the United States. Um, so, I'm not sure exactly w what accounts for that difference, so mm -hmm. that's a I good thing to think about. It might help to look at the differences in the labor movement and how they were organizing, because when, when I saw that picture and you were talking about, about trying to see yourself between a slave and unfree contract versus a wage work, I kept thinking of the Knights of Labor and the Pride of showing your tool and all the importance of masculinity and bringing that together. It's a different way that the labor movement is coming together parts that might help understand why there might be certain things, I'm not sure, but um, Well, Australian labor politics is also very concerned with m their manliness. Mm. But that's, I mean, what I'm trying to argue here is that, that that politics that emerges in the late 19th century in Australia is actually, becomes more and more similar to that what's in the United States because it's drawing from the, ur they're both urban working men's movements. So, yeah, but thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for a really interesting uh, paper. I'm curious about the sort of South African context, particularly because you, there's another community of kind of bonded labor uh, from the, sub, uh, the Indian subcontinent. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, is, are, do they compare these two groups? <laughs> and how does, that, how, do, how does that reflect like the image of the Chinese in South Africa? Right, so that's a really important point that I didn't have time to go into. So. When they wanted to bring, okay, so after the, the war, there's, you know, they have to get the mines going again, and there's, they basically, the native black Africans don't want to work in the mines. So it's almost like a general strike. They just won't go there. So, um, so they first try to get labor from India. Um, and, uh, but they want, but they've already, the al whites in South Africa already kind of in a panic over, the growth of a free Indian population, right? Because after the plantation work is, contracts are finished, they hang, a lot of them hang around, right? They become small businessmen, shopkeepers, you know, they become, they become free labor. Um, so already by the turn of the century, uh, there are more um, South Asians in Natal than there are blacks or whites. So this is an object lesson to white South Africans that they don't want a repeat of this situation. So they want Indians to come work in the gold mines, but they want them to be repatriated at the end of their contracts. And the Indian 
governor says no, because the whole policy of Indian emigration throughout the 19th century had been contracted labor or coolie labor, but you know, freed freedom basically after their contracts expired. So, um, so that's when they go to China because they can impose this condition that Chinese have to leave after the end of their contract. And 99.9% .9 of them are sent back. There are very few that stay. And the free Chinese population, those um, Cantonese merchants that I was referring to, that's a very small community. They actually hook up with Gandhi around restrictions on Chinese businesses throughout both um, Transvaal and, and Natal. So, um, so the experience with Indian contract labor is d the direct antecedent to how they form this uh, pol program for the Chinese. They want to avoid all the problems that they had with South Asians. Um, I really enjoyed the talk and I'm really interested in the way you kind of conceptualize this as um, or kind of theorize it as the great war against China, the global war against China. And it brought to my mind um, W.B. Du Bois's famous statement of the, the history of the 20th century and the history of the right. color line. Exactly. And, uh, so I guess my question is really how high is that wall? Because um, I just wonder kind of how, you know, do, do you think that analogy works, first of all? And, um, and second, do you, uh, how porous do you think it is? Obviously, the color line was very firm in the American South for black and white, and which is what the voice is talking about, and in South Africa, but less so elsewhere. How, how porous do you think the wall was, or how high was it? That, you know, well, Du Bois included Asians in his global color line. He absolutely did. And he understood that there was a relationship in, I guess what we would call today the global south, right, of colored labor internationally. So Du Bois was recognized, I think, and put the American race question in the context of, um, I guess what we today would call globalization, right? The globalization of capital and labor. So I think Du Bois understood the relationship. Um, in terms of how high the wall was, I mean, the wall for purposes of Asiatic exclusion was quite high. It limited severely the number of Chinese and, in and, and, well, in Australia, that was also imposed on, in, on Indians, um, not so much in South Africa. Um, but it not only, I mean, what exclusion did in my mind was that it not only vastly restricted the number of, of labor, Im, laboring immigrants that could move to these countries, it also um, had an impact on trade and Chinese trade. So in the 1850s and even into the 1860s, um, especially before the railroad was completed, um, Chinese Chinese were importing into California not just stuff for Chinese to consume, like rice and tea, and not just luxury items like silk, but Chinese were importing lumber, granite, um, even coffee that was, you know, came from um, Indonesia through Hong Kong, right? Because Hong Kong is this big entrepot in, 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 that er in, in southern the South China Sea. So Chinese were in, I mean, Chinese, Chinese imported the granite that built, you know, the first banks in downtown San Francisco in the 1850s, the Wells Fargo Company and, and the first banks. So Chinese um, trade was very high. And when Bigler made his speech in 1852, he was rebutted by uh, a group of Chinese merchants who who first rebutted all of his charges you know he said why would why would anybody be induced to come work at wages lower than what they make in China right i mean he said it's all they said it's ridiculous and they they defended chinese people's honor and, and integrity but they also said look you people in america you want trade with china you cannot cut immigration and still have trade and they understood that trade and migration go together, right? That they're complementary. They're always complementary in terms of global exchange and contact. 
So they said, if you want to stop Chinese migration, you have to stop trade. This is why today we have Trump, who has this protectionist line that's both about trade and immigration, right? He understands the connection. Right, exactly, right? Exactly, right? So this is the new protectionism is both anti it's both nativist, but it's also a trade policy. So in this era, when free trade is the mantra of, of everybody, right, that these Chinese merchants are pointing out, if you want to cut migration, you have to cut trade. And what the, what the British and the Americans figure out is how to have an open door that swings only one way. So they get the trade, but trade controlled by the West, right, that can still go into China and also take things out of China, right, so they, d they pervert and distort a world which has previously been based on free trade and free, free migration. The wall is built around nation states, around um, nationalism, is right. Like your argument, right. Right. So, uh, right. Is, there, is there a kind of transfer internally? Are there any kind of legal rules that are against Chinese domestically? In oh, well, yes, absolutely. Um, much more so in the United States. Um, I mean, Australia never had anti miscegenation laws, right? And they did not forbid Chinese from owning property. I mean, Asians in many states in the United States are forbidden to own not, all, not real estate, but agricultural property. Um, and that, that was especially aimed at Japanese uh, later, later in the, in the early 20th century. Um, uh, Chinese could not uh, testify in court against whites. They could not sit on a jury. They were excluded from citizenship. I mean, part of the immigration law was that they were excluded from citizenship. In Australia, they were not excluded from citizenship. They were restricted from immigration, but they were not excluded from citizenship. Um, so in Australia, you don't have the same kind of civil rights discriminations. It's more customary and social exclusions. So it's much looser in Australia than in the United States. And in South Africa, of course, there are myriad discriminations imposed on, on free Chinese, um, merchants especially. They have special taxes. They can, only, they can only have businesses in certain areas, which is also interesting because poor whites defend Chinese merchants in poor white communities because they charge less. Um, and they actually have difficulty forcing Chinese merchants to move to the special districts that they want them to. So there's a lot of stuff that goes on. And of course, both with Chinese leaders and with Gandhi leading the South, South Asians, you have a lot of civil rights protests. So in the end, South Africa is not able to impose on Indians or Chinese um, fingerprinting laws. Of, of free, f free Asians, um, uh, they have to register, but it's well, they don't. Ha they're not forced to register. It's a voluntary registration, but that's only after the result of a lot of um, organizing and litigation. So it varies quite a bit. Can you take one more question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I also really enjoyed that talk. It was really great. Um, I just had a quick question about religion and um, uh -huh. what role. I think religion plays in the story, and does Christianity in some ways help to knit together various places that you talk about around the world? Um, hmm. the, the Christian missionaries, I think, are most active in California, um, and their goal is to, uh, con uh, is to convert Chinese so they can send them back to China to save all those souls in China. That's the, that's the prize, right? Um, so the missionaries are probably the only social group of Americans that oppose um, the violence and discrimination against the Chinese. There are some business interests who also support Chinese, but they're, they're really pushed to the margins. Um, so it's, it's the missionaries who, um, uh, you know, and it's through them that uh, Chinese encounter, um, you know, uh, groups that will teach them English um, and support them in, in their legal battles. Um, so they do play a very important role in the United States. Um, there are some uh, Christian missionaries or um, clergy in the gold fields who work with Chinese, but not as many. It's interesting, not, not as many.
Um, and I haven't seen any evidence of the clergy in South Africa <laughs> being uh, a vocal on, on these questions. Right. But the rate of conversion is very, very, very low. Very, very low. I have a very quick follow-up mm -hmm. question. Is, is it also then part of um, racial othering? Well, I guess that's partly what I was also thinking about. And it was a sort of a Christian attitude towards um, Chinese minds. Right. So, very, so, right. So a common racial stereotype is that Chinese are heathens. Right. Right. That yeah, they're so heathens. It's right. It's yeah, part of their um, supposed uh, civilizational backwardness. Right. Okay, well I'd just like to thank Professor and Guy for a really regular keynote lecture. It's a fantastic start. Okay, thank, thank you, you very thank much. You so much.